Well, welcome back to our course on system engineering. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about functional analysis and following our textbook, this will be aligned with chapter seven. Um, just to give a context where we're at, we gave a nice introduction with the foundation. There was four chapters we went over that. Now this is the third of the chapters that we're getting into this third this first of three major sections in the system engineering process. Um, and this is going to be focusing on functional analysis. And so let's go ahead and kick this off by thinking about selecting the system concept. Functional analysis is the key transition from needs analysis where new needs and concepts are developed to the functional analysis phase where the, the new system concept starts to be engineered. Functions to be to describe the system's activities, interactions, and operations are created here. The system engineer has several tools to create these products during this phase in order to socialize ideas to ensure completeness of the envisioned system, as well as lay the foundation for physical design, the concept definition phase of the system, Life cycle marks the beginning of the serious, dedicated effort to define the functional and physical characteristics of a new system or a major upgrade of an existing system that is proposed to meet an operational need and requirements defined in the preceding conceptual phase phases. It marks a commitment to characterize the system in sufficient detail to enable its operational performance, time of development, and life cycle cost to be predicted in quantitative terms. The level of effort in the concept definition phase is sharply greater than in previous phases as system designers and engineering specialists are added to the system engineers and analysts who largely staffed its preceding phases. In most needs-driven systems developments, this phase is conducted by several competing developers based on performance requirements developed in the preceding phases or by the customer. The output of the phase is the selection from a number of alternative system concepts of sp specific configuration that will constitute the, the baseline for development and engineering. From this phase on, the, the system development consists of implement, implementing the selected system concept with modifications as necessary in hardware and software and engineering it for production and operational use. With the advent and formal definition of system architecting, this phase has been known in some sources as a system architecting phase. While this may not be entirely appropriate, system architecting as it is now defined and understood as a major activity within this phase. The specifics of system architecting are discussed in another chapter. So let's think of the place of the concept definition phase in the system life cycle. So we're now having a focused view of what we've shared before, but now getting into this specific area. Place of the concept definition phase and the overall system development is shown in this figure. It constitutes the, the last phase of the concept development stage and leads to the initiation of the engineering development stage beginning with the advanced development phase. Its inputs are system performance requirements, the, the technology base that includes a number of feasible system concepts and the contractual and organizational framework in, in which the system development is to be cast. Its outputs are system functional specifications, a defined system concept, and a detailed plan for the ensuing engineering program. The planning outputs of this phase are usually specified to include the System Engineering Management Plan, SEMP, S-E-M-P, which defines in detail the, the system engineering approach to be followed, the work breakdown structure, WBS, cost estimates for development and production, test plans, and such other supporting materials as may be directed. When the customer is the government, laws specify that all acquisition programs be conducted competitively, except in unusual circumstances. The co competition frequency 
frequently occurs during its concept definition phase. It is customarily begins with a formal solicitation, which contains the system requirements, usually at the level of total system functionality, performance, and compatibility. Based on the solicitation, competing contractors carry out a proposed preparation effort, which embodies the concept definition phase of the program. The system concept and approach proposed by the successful bidder, or in some cases, more than one, then becomes the baseline for the ensuing system development. In the development of commercial product, the concept definition phase generally begins after the conclusion of a feasibility study, which is established a valid need for the product and the feasibility of meeting the, the need by one or more technical approaches. It is the point at which the company has decided to commit significant resources to define the product to a degree where a further decision can be made whether or not to proceed to the full-scale development. Except for the formality and requirements for detailed documentation, the general technical activities during the phase for commercial and government programs are similar. One or several design concepts may be pursued depending on the perceived importance of the object and available funds. Well, next let's discuss the design materialization status. And so we'll think about that in, in this phase, the concept definition phase. So in the previous phase, we were concerned with the system design only to the level necessary to define a set of performance requirements that could be realized with a feasible system design. And that would not rule out other ad advantageous design concepts. And we talked about that in the last lecture and the last chapter. For that purpose, it was sufficient to define functions at the subsystem level and only visualize the type of components that would be needed to implement the concept. In order to define a system to the level where its operational performance, development effort, and production costs can be estimated with any degree of confidence by, anal by analogy with previous previously developed systems, the conceptual design must be carried one level further. Thus, in the concept definition phase, the design focuses on components, the fundamental building block of the systems. So as we're seeing in the table that I'm showing here, which is um, the, the, the focus is on the, the on, on the focus in this phase is on the selected selection and function definition of the system components and the definition of their configuration into subsystems. So as we progress through the contents of the, the textbook and our lectures, what we'll be doing is highlighting in um, a colorized fashion the things that get into the, the topics that we're, we're dealing with. So performance of the above task is primarily a systems engineering responsibility since they address technical issues that often cut across both the technical disciplines and organizational boundaries. However, the functional definition task can be efficiently carried out only if the component implementation used to achieve each prescribed function is reasonably well understood and is sufficiently visualized to serve as a, the basis for risk assessment and costing, which cannot be carried out solely at the functional level. Accordingly, as with many systems engineering tasks, consultation with an advice from ex experienced system, experienced design specialists is al almost always required, especially in cases where advanced technology may be used to extend subsystem performance beyond the, the previous achieved levels. Next, let's um, discuss functional analysis and formulation. So it has been seen that in keeping with the inherent magnitude of designing a complex system, the, the systems engineering method divides the design into two closely coupled steps. One, analyzing and formulating the functional design of the system, dealing with what action is needed to perform. 
and selecting two, selecting the most advantageous implementation of the system functions, how the actions can best be physically generated. The close coupling between these steps res results from the, the mutual independence, which requirements both visualization of the implementation step in for formulating the, the functional design and iteration of the implementation step when alternative approaches are considered. Those familiar with software engineering will recognize these two steps as design and implementation respectively. So in terms of the, the definition of component functions, the, the system materialization process in the concept definition phase is mainly concerned with the functional definition of system components. If the details of the concept exploration phase are available, the functional configuration of the system level has already been explored. If not, they will have, they, they will have almost always been exploratory studies preceding the, the formal start of a concept de definition that have laid out one or more candidate top level concepts that serve as a starting point for component functional design. Functional, in terms of fun, functional block um, building blocks, the, the general nature of the task of transitioning, translating performance requirements into the system functions can be illustrated by using the concept of system functional building blocks. The following steps are involved. One, identification of functional media, the type of mediums that is signals, data, materials, energy, and force involved in each of the primary system functions can usually be readily associated with one of these five classes. Two, identification of functional elements. Operations on each of the five classes of media are represented by five or, or six basic function, functional elements, each performing a significant function and found in a wide variety of system types. The system actions, that is the functions can be con constructed from a selection of those functional building blocks. Three, relation of performance requirements to element attributes. Each functional element possesses several key performance attributes. For example, speed, accuracy, capacity. If these can be related to the relevant system performance requirements, it confirms the correct selection of the functional element. Four, configuration of functional elements. The functional elements selected to achieve the required performance characteristics must be interconnected and grouped into integrated subsystems. This may require additional inter interfacing, that is input and out output and elements to achieve connectivity. Five, analysis and integration of the ex external interactions. The given performance requirements often leaves out important interactions of the, the system with its operational or other environmental, for example, external controls or energy source. These interactions need to be integrated into the total functional configuration. It's not advisable to attempt to optimize at this stage the initial formulation of the system functional design will need to be modified after the subsequent step of the physical definition and the ensuing iteration. Then we have functional interactions. The, the functional elements are inherently co constituted to require a minimum of interconnections to other elements besides primary input and outputs. However, most of them depend on external controls and sources of energy as well as being housed or supported by a material structure. The gr this, their grouping in, into subsystems should be such as to make each subsystem as self-sufficient as possible. Minimizing critical functional interactions among different subsystems has two purposes. One is to aid the system development, engineering, integration, tests, maintenance, and logistics support. The other is to facilitate making future changes in the system during its operational life to upgrade its effectiveness. When several different ways to group functions, that is functional configurations are comparably effective, 
these alternatives should be carried forward to the next step of the design process where a choice of the superior configuration may be more obvious. Next, we're gonna get into functional block diagramming tools and I'll just um, go ahead and show the, the next slide to give you some insight into this functional block diagramming tools. So several form, formal tools and methods exist and continue to be developed for representing a system functional functionality and their interactions. Commercial industry have used the functional flow diagram, FFD, formally referred to as the functional flow block diagram, FFBD, to represent not only func functionality, but also the flow of control or any of the five basic elements. This diagramming technique can be used at multiple levels to form a hierarchy of functionality. The integrated definition, IDEF, I-D-E-F, method was developed in the 70s and 80s. And in fact, IDEF extends beyond functionality and now encompasses a range of capability described for a system. An integrated definition zero, IDEF zero, is the primary technique for representing system functionality. The basic construct is the functional, functional entity represented by a rectangle, as we're showing here in the figure. Strict rules exist to identify interfaces to and from a function. Sometimes detail is included within the box, such as the listing of multiple functions performed by the entity. Other times the inside of the rectangle is left blank. Inputs always enter from the left, outputs exit to the right. Controls that are separate from the inputs enter the function from the top and mechanisms or implementations enter from the bottom. One of the simplest diagramming techniques is the functional block diagram, FBD. The technique is similar to FFBD, but without the, the flow structure and IDEF zero, but without the diagramming rules. Basically, each function is represented by a rectangle interfacing between functions and identified by, by directional arrows and are labeled to represent what is being passed between the functions. When a function interfaces with an external entity, the entity is represented in some fashion, for example, a rectangle, a circle, et cetera, and an interface arrow is provided. Well, let's consider an example of a functional block diagram for a coffee maker. And it's going to be divided up into 11 elements. And these blocks, the, the rectangles, have the, the numbers associated with them. So in terms of input functions, we have accept user commands on or off, receive coffee materials, distribute electricity, and distribute distribute weight. The, that's the first category. The second is a transformative functions, the, the heat water, mix hot water with coffee grinds, fill out coffee grinds, filter out coffee grinds, and warm the brewed coffee. And then the third category is the output functions. It provides status, facilitates removal of materials, and dissipates the heat. So we're seeing this in this figure. It's a, um, a functional block diagram, FBD, using these 11 functions. Three external entities were described. Um, so the, the user, a power source, um, and the environment. Note that within the, the functions list and the diagram, maintenance is not considered. This is due to the nature of household appliances in general and coffee makers in particular. They are not designed to be maintained. They are, quote, expendable or, quote, throw away. Since it is difficult to avoid crossing lines, um, several mechanisms exist to distinguish between separate interface arrows. Color is probably the most prevalent, but other methods such as dashed lines are used as well. In the case of power, we have simply listed the functions that require power for example, F5, we have um, tried to be rather thorough in this example to help the, the reader think through the process of identifying functions and developing a functional structure for the system. 
Simplifying this diagram would not be difficult since we could omit several functions at this stage as long as we did not forget about them later on. For example, um, function number 10, facilitate removal of the materials could be omitted at this stage as long as we ultimately, the, the ultimate design does not in, indeed al allow the user to easily remove materials. Notice as well that we can categorize the functions into those handling the, the five best basic elements. And so we have three things that we can be considering. Um, first, that for the materials, um, receive coffee materials, mix the hot water with coffee grinds, filter out coffee grinds, and facilitate removal of materials. So that'd be the first part, materials. Um, the second is data signals and energy. It provides status, accepts um, user commands. It um, distributes electricity heats water, um, warm brewed coffee, and dissipate heat. And the third category is the force, and under that we have uh, distribute the weight. So this is not a, quote, clean categorization since some functions input one type of element and convert it to another. For example, function two, accept user commands, input a datum, and converts it to signals. Subjective judgment is necessary. The system modeling language, SysML, provides similar capabilities and allows rigor, rigorous definition of the function inputs and outputs. These are typically expressed using model elements such as operations, signals, and parameters. Competent SysML modeling integrates these functional expressions with interface definitions and support automated error checking, such as ensuring that a, a legal interface exists between the, the system elements whose functions are ex exchanging data, energy, or material. So we're going to be talking about system in more uh, detail in a later chapter, as well as the project work that we're going to be addressing. So let's talk about a couple other related um, concepts that we want to make sure that we include in this um, subsection. So first of all, let's talk about hardware software allocation. The issue of whether a given function should be performed by hardware or software may seem like a question of implementation rather than function. However, system level issues are almost always involved in such decisions, such as the effect on operator interfaces, test equipment, and widespread interaction with other system elements. Accordingly, the definition of functional building blocks makes a clear distinction between software elements, that is control system and control processing and hardware elements dealing with process signals and process data, for these reasons, the functional definition at the component level should include the allocation of significant process processing functions to either hardware or software. An important consideration in such decisions is provision for future growth potential to keep up with the rapidly advancing data processing technology. In software embedded systems, software tends to be assigned to most of the critical functions especially those related to controls because of its versatility. In software intensive systems in, in which virtually all the, the functionality is performed by software, functional allocation is not a straight, as straightforward because of the absence of commonly occurring functional elements. Another chapter and also another lecture will describe the inherent differences between hardware and software and their effect on the system design and address, addresses the methods used in design, designing software system architectures. To the extent that the decision may be involved in selecting functional elements, configure, configuring them or quantifying their function characteristics, trade-offs should be made among the candidates using a set of predefined criteria. Then in terms of simulation, the analysis of the behavior of the system that have dynamic modes of response to events occurring in their environment often requires the construction of computer-driven models that simulate such behavior. The analysis of the motion of an aircraft, or for that matter, of any vehicle requires the use of a simulation that embodies its kinematic characteristics. 
Simulations can be thought of as a form of experimental testing. They are used to obtain the, the information critical to the design process in, in a much shorter time and a lesser cost than building and testing system components. In effect, simulation, simulations permit designers and analysts to, to gain an understanding of how a system will behave before the, the system exists in physical form. Simulations also permit designers to conduct what-if experiments by making selected changes in key parameters. Simulations are dynamic, that is, they represent time-dependent behavior. They are driven by a program set of inputs or scenarios whose parameters may be varied to produce the, the par particular responses to be studied. It may include input-output functional modes of, of select selected system elements. These characteristics are especially useful for conducting system trade-off studies. So in the concept definition phase, system simulation is particularly useful in the concept selection process, especially in cases where the dynamic behavior of the system is important. Simulation of these several alternative concepts permit the concept of experiments that present the candidates with a range of critical potential challenges. Use of the simulation results in scoring the candidates is generally more meaningful and persuasive than using judgment alone. Then just to, to finish up, here is just one final thing, the formation formulation of functional specifications. One of the output of the concept definition phase is a set of system functional specifications to serve as an input to the advanced development phase. It is appropriate to formulate a preliminary set of functional specifications at this step in the process to lay the groundwork for more formal documentation. This also serves as a check on the completeness and consistency of the functional analysis. In stating functional specifications, it is essential to quanti quantify them insofar as may be inferred from the performance and compatibility requirements. The qualifications should be considered provisional at this time to be iterated during the physical definition step and incorporated into the formal system functional specification document at the end of the concept definition phase. It is at this level in the system hierarchy that the physical configuration becomes clearly evident. Next, we'll talk about functional allocation. So at this initial phase of the system development process, functional analysis is an extension of the operational studies directed to establish whether there is a feasible technical approach to a system that could meet the operational objectives. At this stage, the term, quote, feasible is synonymous with, quote, possible and implies making the case that there is a good likelihood that such a system could be developed with the existing state of the art without having to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. So with that, we want to look at the transition of operational objectives into system functions. To make such a case, it is necessary to visualize the, the type of system that could carry out certain action in response to its environment that would meet the projected operational objectives. This requires an analysis of the types of functional capabilities that the system would have to possess in order to perform the desired operational actions. In needs-driven systems, this analysis is focused on those functional characteristics needed to satisfy those operational objectives that are not adequately handled by current systems. In technology-driven systems, the, advantage, the advances in functional performances would presumably be as associated with the technology in question. In any case, both the feasibility of these approaches and their capability to realize the desired operational gains must be adequately demonstrated. The visualization of a feasible system concept is inherently an abstract process that relies on reasoning on the, the basis of analogy. This means that at, 
that all the elements of the concept should be functionally related to elements of real systems. A helpful approach to the translation of operational objectives to function is to consider the type of primary media, that is signals, data, material, or energy that are most likely to be involved in accomplishing the, the various operational objectives. This association usually points to the class of subsystems that operate on the mediums, as for example, sensors or communication subsystems in the case of signals, computing subsystems for, for data, and so on. In the above process, it must be shown that all of the principal system functions, especially those that represent advances over previous systems, are similar to those already demonstrated in some practical context. An exception to this process of reasoning by analogy is when an entirely new type of technology or application is a principal part of a proposed system. In this case, it may be necessary to go beyond analysis and demonstrate its feasibility by modeling and, and ultimately experimentation. In identifying the top level functions that the system needs to perform, it is important even at this early stage to, to visualize the entire system lifecycle, including its non-operational phases. So this um, uh, above discussion is not meant to imply that all considerations at this stage are quantitative, qualitative. On the contrary, when primary quantitative issues are involved, it is necessary to perform as much quantitative analysis as available um, resources and existing knowledge permit. Okay, well, let's show some examples and we'll integrate this into our, our discussion as we continue. Let's think about the allocation of functions to subsystems. In cases where an operational of, of objectives can be directly associated with the system level functions that are analogous to those present exhibited by various real systems, it is still essential to visualize just how these might be allocated, combined, and implemented in the, the new system. For this purpose, it is not necessary to visualize some best system configuration. Rather, it need only be shown that the development and production of an appropriate system is, in fact, feasible. Towards this end, a top level system concept that implements all of the prescribed functions should be visualized in order to demonstrate that the desired capabilities can be obtained by a plausible combination of the prescribed functions and technical features. Here it is particularly important that all interactions and interfaces, both external and inter internal to the system be identified and associated with the system functions and that a trade-off process be employed to ensure that the consideration of various system attributes is thorough and properly balanced. This is typically done in terms of initial concept of, of operation. So let's consider a, an example. A simple matrix allocating the subsystems to functions may be developed in order to visualize, visually see which functions are being performed by, by none, one or more subsystems as we're showing in the figure. In the case of no subsystems being allocated, this represents a gap capability and should be resolved. In the case of one subsystem allocating to, to the function, this may result in a single point of failure. That is if the, the subsystem does fail, although limits on systems such as weight or size constraints may necessitate the, the, the single subsystem. In the case of multiple subsystems that perform the same function, this may be a case of redundant subsystems, which would be something that would be planned, or overlapping subsist uh, subsystem coverage could be unplanned, which may be a cause conflict of failures or, or different performance may elicit a, a different capability. And so an example uh, of such an al allocation matrix is gonna be shown in the, the next, um, slide here. So just um, we'll be getting to that shortly. Well, let's unpack the, the details of this simple figure here just to get a chance to see how this would work. 
So um, in, in this case, function one only has uh, subsystem A allocated. Function two has subsystem B and C allocated, perhaps for redundancy. Function three has no subsystem allocated and should be reviewed and corrected. Subsystems A, B, C, and E are all allocated to functions, but subsystem D does not have any functions, which may be co a consideration for removal. If it's not doing something useful, why do we have it as part of our system? Well, let's talk about the functional exploration and allocation. The exploration of potential system configurations is performed at both the functional and physical levels. The range of different functional approaches that produce behavior suitable to, to meet the, the system operation requirement is generally much more limited than the possibilities for different physical implementations. However, they are there are often several significantly different ways of obtaining the, call, the called for operational actions. It is important that the performance characteristics of these different functional approaches be considered in setting the, the bounds on system performance requirements. One of the outputs of this step is the allocation of operational requirements to individual subsystems. This is important in order to set the stage for the next step in which the, the basic physical building blocks components may be visualized as part of the exploration of implementation concepts. These two steps are very tightly bound through iterative loops. Two important inputs to the functional allocation process are the predecessor system and functional building blocks. In most cases, the functions performed by the subsystem of the predecessor subsystem the predecessor system will largely carry over to the new system. Accordingly, the predecessor system is especially useful as a point of departure in defining a functional architecture for the new system. And since each functional building block is associated with both a set of performance characteristics and a particular type of physical component, the, the building blocks can be used to establish the, the selection and the interconnection of elementary functions and the, the associated components needed to provide the prescribed system, subsystem functionality. Well, let's figure um, finish up our discussion on functional allocations and um, using this diagram um, to further the the clarification and allow us for to, con to continue to make a few points and then we'll get into the details will be the context of this slide. To aid in the process of identifying those system functions responsible for the operational characteristics, recall that functional media can be classed into four basic types. We've mentioned this a number of times now, signals, data, materials, and energy. The process addresses the following series of questions. Are these operational objectives, number one, are these operational objectives that require sensing or communications? If so, this means that the, the signal input processing and output functions must be involved. Two, does the system require information to control its operations? If so, how are data generated, processed, stored, or otherwise used? Three, does system operation involve structures or, or machinery to house support or process materials? If so, what operation contains support processes um, or manip manipulate material elements? And four, does the system require energy to activate, move, power, or otherwise provide necessary motion or heat? Furthermore, functions can be divided again into three categories, input, transformative, and output. Input functions relate to the process of sensing and inputting the signals, data, material, and energy into the system. Output functions relate to the process of interpreting, displaying, and synthesizing, and outputting the signal, data, material, and energy out of these, the system. The transformative functions relate to the process of transforming the input to the outputs of the, the four types of the functional media. Of course, for complex systems, the number of transformative functions may be quite large, 
and has subsequent, quote, sequence of transformations. So we're trying to depict that in this figure, the, the concept of the two-dimensional construct functional categories versus functional media. In constructing an initial functional list, it helps to identify input and output. This list directly leads to leads the engineer to a list of input and output functions. The transformative functions may be easier to identify when examining them in the light of a system's input and outputs. Next, let's look at the functional analysis products. We are listing three here on the slide and we'll have an example of each one. So we'll get a chance to be talking about them in more detail. So are there several products that systems engineers will use to describe the, the system's functions? The most common three products are FBD, FFD, and the sequence diagrams, SD. For each of these products, a simplified description of how the systems engineer will approach the problem and develop the product is described. For simplicity, we will continue the, the coffee maker problem. So let's think about how to, to build the FBD first. And so um, as we were discussing previously in, in a figure, we have previously identified the relevant functions of a coffee maker. So now we're going to be use those into some functional analysis and develop some products. But how did we derive these functions? How do we know our FBD is complete? Some of these steps described below should assist in just the, the reader or um, you, the, the listener, in linking the, the basic concepts to, to build a FBD. We start with the context diagram. It contains a description of what is in and out of the scope of our system. Residing inside the scope should be the, the, the basic concepts slash structures of our system. In the case of the coffee maker, it may be the internal heating element, liquids reservoir, receptacle for holding the grounds, receptacle for, for holding the brewed coffee, the power interface, and user display interface. Outside the scope would be the external power source, users, coffee grounds to be used, water to be used, and the environment that the coffee maker would operate in. Implied are also the structures, that is the tables, that would support the coffee maker. We then ask the stakeholder to describe the envisioned functions to brew a cup of coffee while describing the activities of each of the elements. Presumably, there would also be an input to each of the functions as well as an output from, from each of the functions. In some cases, there would be only an input, that is the, the starting functions, and only an output, that is the concluding functions. Elicitation of the functions would occur from a variety of users and in different perspectives. Some examples may be the, the user of the, the maintainer or in the event that the coffee maker is not working properly, which may have different functions. For the purpose of this text, we will focus on the, the user's perspective and the development of the FBD. Each function should then start with a verb and have a qualifying infinitive. Now we're going to, over two slides, talk about the development of the um, FBD for the coffee maker. So we can then approach the FBD development in two ways. First, by listing all of the functions that the coffee maker perform internally, then tracing the internal functions, and then finally linking to all the external functions outside of the scope. So we're seeing that in this figure for an example. This approach may be applicable if the development, if developing a novel system and, and are focusing on the system characteristics first and then developing the external interface later. Second, we may also um, approach the FBD by listing all the external functions with the coffee maker with the external entities. And we'll see this in the next slide. Then we can describe the internal functions of the coffee maker and trace them to the various external outputs. 
This process may be used if we know all of the external entities and interfaces ahead of time. This may be applicable to, to systems that must work in, in a legacy environment where there are existing systems that our system must work within. So we're seeing first the, the internal um, centric, and then we have the external centric in this slide. So we'll continue the conversation. And finally, how do we know that the FBD is complete? By walking through all of the various possible use cases or scenarios on how coffee is brewed. We can then explore all of the different variations of how the system would operate. Each of these scenarios should start with a starting function traced to the various intermediate functions and then end with a concluding function. Generally, the, the linking of functions would occur when an output from one function is an input to, the, to a different function. Note that some of these functions may reuse similar blocks of functions, although have a, a different outcome. One scenario is when the coffee maker is used to heat only water. Another scenario is when the coffee maker is used to heat water and pour over grounds. Another scenario is when the coffee maker is used as a timer only. And all three scenarios that the user commands may be similar, for example, setting the timer, but the results in three different outputs. Well, next, let's talk about the, the second type of product here, and this is building the FFD, the functional flow diagram. So as we are soliciting, soliciting the functions that are to be used in our system, we will also need to understand how these functions are linked together logically. Does each function need to be completely executed first before progressing to the next function? Are there other functions that are occurring in, in parallel? Are there dependencies of the functions that require all of them to be complete, complete before progressing to the next function? Are there options that only one function needs to be satisfied before progressing to the next? These, these questions help us start to build an FFD. This is similar to an FBD, but instead of the interfaces, we merely need to state the, the logic between, between the functions. If there is a serial flow of activity, for example, one function is executed and then outputs to the successive function, they need a simple link, for example, a line between the, the function that's displayed. If there is, is logic, for example, a logical and or a logical or decision in the diagram, these are called summing gates, then these may be shown on the FFB, FFD. So here we're seeing an example of that. And then um, just for, for some additional information here, we also have so some of these details here that explain the, um, the details. And then we actually put it all together in a complete flow. So those are the, the first two. And then finally, we have the, the sequence diagram or SD. The sequence diagram is intended to graphically show interactions between the actors where they are in series or in parallel, similar to the F FD. The SD is concerned more with the interactions or messages and can either be functional, that is the actors would be functions in this case, or could be physical, the actors would be components, organizations, people, or systems. The SD is generally constrained to focus on specific capabilities, so the diagram is limited to a single scenario. Unlike the FBD and FFD that encompass multiple scenarios, elicitation from the stakeholders would be similar as other functional products by allowing stakeholders to describe what actions and interactions are ongoing while executing the, the scenario. In this case, the, the order of interactions will matter as some functions slash activities will have dependencies based on when the interactions are received. Care should be taken to document the interactions in any temporal sequence to ensure that the SD is properly constructed. Having a, a completed FBD and or an FFD will assist the system engineer to elicit the proper sequence of commands slash interactions 
while constructing DSD. So in the figure, we see an example of the coffee maker SD from a functional perspective. And so now we've had um, three examples of these types of products that we can generate. Well, next we'll talk about the traceability to requirements. Tracing requirements to functions while developing the functional architecture is critical in order to ensure that the system functions are being developed with some purpose with the, the requirements providing the, the linkage to the user slash stakeholder needs. The systems engineer can allocate these functions and requirements in order to account for the allocation as well as perform analysis on these pairing that are over, over allocated. For example, too many functions depend on the single requirement or those requirements or functions that are not allocated at all. The former may be addressed by increasing the level of specificity to the requirement or function and decomposing to a greater detail. The later is more troubling in that a requirement exists that does not have a corresponding function. Therefore, the system may not be able to execute the requirement or that a function exists without requirements without a requirement, thus raising the question of why the function exists in the first place. For those requirements that have multiple functions, a logical check may be in order to assess the allocation. Presumably, if all functions are successfully executed, then the requirement is satisfied. However, what happens if one or more functions are not executed? Does the requirement fail completely, fail partially, what is the impact to the system if the requirement does fail? Well, let's finish our conversation on traceability to requirements. And so here we'll be relating this to the functions to requirements allocation. So additional analysis may be completed to show completeness of the functional allocation to the requirements. Using automated tools, the, the system engineer can quickly run through the functions and requirements to see which ones are allocated and which ones are not requiring additional attention. For a medical um, system example, what we're showing in the table, it provides a manual version of the allocation process. A check indicates a function is allocated to the requirement and counting the number of functional requirement pairing, which is a sum of the pairing. If there is a threshold value where the, the systems engineer deems over allocated, then the, the team may evaluate whether to decompose the, the function slash requirement and re reallocate the remaining function slash requirements. The system engineer can method methodologi methodically move through the, the functional architecture so in this case, the FBD, and for each function, identify which of the requirements the, the function will satisfy. In some cases, the function may satisfy multiple requirements. This may also identify gaps in the requirements where there is a function without requirements. This issue may be returned to the requirements engineer in co consultation with the, the stakeholders and users. The function should be verified by, by the user that it is a valid function. The stakeholder in turn must validate the requirement. Configuration control should be maintained when comparing the functional architecture with the requirements as likely separate teams are working on these products and may be doing, the, doing so independently of the other teams. In a traditional system engineering approach, these teams may be separated in time and the functional team may, may not start until the requirement team has finished, requiring some reconstitution of the requirement team. If additional requirements are, or modifications need to be made in an agile system engineering approach, these teams may frequently collaborate as both products are being developed simultaneously, requiring some version control and co coordination of the, the products as they are analyzed. The modeling tools used in model-based system engineering facilitate these functional analyses, allocations, and reports. 
Specifics vary based upon the, the tools and language, but the reader is encouraged to explore the potential of any tool available. For example, connecting nodes on any activity diagram can automatically display those connections on a properly defined matrix, eliminate, eliminating the need um, eliminating the need to keep them in sync manually, which would be a huge benefit. Next, let's talk about the concept development space. Often the development space starts with describing the problem space, starting with the context diagrams, as we have mentioned before. This may be found with the functional analysis phase by identifying what is in and out of scope for the envisioned system context. The systems engineer may use the context diagram as a mechanism to solicit additional inputs from stakeholders, one to ensure the system is correctly described both in function as well as in interface, two, to enable the creative thinking on what could be imagined by the system context that is currently not e existing. This may be a way to promote the creativity of the stakeholders that are consulting. Steps to examine the context diagram to ensure completeness may include the following questions. Do we have the, the, the context scope set correctly? Are there other items missing inside the scope? Are there items that would, would describe uh, future capabilities within the scope? Are the correct external entities for example, systems, organizations, people listed? Are the interface, interfaces and directionality correctly described? Are the entities that we would envision the system operating with in the future? Given an example of how the system is intended to operate, for example, regular operation, emergency operation, maintenance operation, does the context diagram capture the correct organizations and interfaces? Are there any human factors or users that may play a role in how the system is intended to operate? So here we have a, some more details that can be beneficial here, looking at a morphological box. Um, consider also the development of a morphological box concept that may also promote additional creativity on how the system context diagram may be displayed and also to uncover what may be evaluated. The systems thinking tool allows multiple factors to be displayed in order to identify a solution. The system concept is combined with a combination of different perspectives and organization, which are then evaluated as a valid or invalid combination. This may be done to reject organizational bias or existing system operation and may encourage consideration of potential, potentially unrealized combinations. And so example is provided here with a coffee maker containing four components, heating coil, water carafe, grounds holder, and voltage. Each uh, component has two levels, small and large. The box shows a potential combination in an eight by eight box with yes as the acceptable combination, sub as suboptimal, and NA as non-applicable that links to the other level, and no as an infeasible combination of component levels. So we've created an N by N matrix where N is the number of items we're going to explore, and then we have a value rating for each one, as we've seen there. All right, well, let's finish up and we'll do a summary review. So these are the concepts that we spoke about, uh, selecting the system concept. Objectives of the, the concept definition phase are to select a preferred system configuration and define system functional specifications as well as a development schedule and cost. Concept definition concludes the concept development stage, which lays the basis for the engineering development stage of the system life cycle, which will be the second major part of the system engineering process that we'll talk about. Defining a preferred concept also provides a baseline for development and engineering. Activities that, are, uh, that comprise concept definition are 
performance requirements analysis, which deals with relating to operational objectives, functional analysis and formulation, which deals with allocating functions to components, concept selection, which deals with choosing the preferred concept by trade-off analysis, concept validation, which deals with confirming the, the val validity and superiority of the chosen concept. We talked about functional analysis and formulation. Functional system building blocks are useful for functional definition. Selection of a preferred concept is a system engineering function which formulates and compares evaluation of a range of alternative concepts. We talked about functional allocation. Developing alternative concepts requires part art and part science. Certainly the predecessor system can act as a baseline for further concepts, assuming your predecessor is available. Brainstorming and other team innovation techniques can assist in developing alternatives. In terms of functional analysis products, um, FBD, that they identify the system function and the external organizations that interact with the system, connect them together either internally or externally first, whichever may be more comfortable to visualize how your system interacts with the operational environment. FFD, identify the, the system functions and connect them using logic gates, um, say AND gates or OR gates to do the fun to do the functions require all or just some inputs from previous functions to execute the, the function. And SD, the sequence diagrams that identifies the organizations, users, systems, and subsystems or components of the, the system concept. Connect them in time as you as a as your scenario starts. Do the interactions require a unique input or are there multiple inputs? Similar for the outgoing mes messages, are there singles or simultaneous messages that go out? We talked about traceability to requirements, um, mapping the functions to the requirements and uh, identify where there are either gaps or overlapping functional functions slash requirements. If there are no gaps, then a requirement has no su supporting functions or a uh, function has no requirements it supports. This is just to say that again. So if there are gaps, there are, it, then a requirement has no supporting function or function has no requirements it supports. This will either require the systems engineer to find a suitable pairing or delete the function slash requirement. If there are over allocating pairs, then look at decomposing either the function into additional sub functions or decompose the requirement into multiple requirements. And finally, we talked about the concept development space, um, developing the correct concept both in scope and level of detail. It may require multiple perspectives to ensure that the team has considered the representative set of functions, interactions with the correct organization slash systems slash threats, and operating in the representative operational environment. All right, well, thank you very much, that's it.